switcheroo here. Oh. Our last speaker of the day is is Dr. Alan McConaughey, who's a research is research officer at the Hertzberg Institute. Uh, got it, and a professor of astrophysics at Victoria. He's a specialist in the evolution of galaxies and galactic archaeology, which is a term I like. He can explain it better than I can. He's not talking about that, well, not directly. He's talking about the Mauna Kea Spectroscopic Explorer, which is a re-envisioning of the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. And you think of the Canada France Hawaii Telescope as analogies never work, but this is Canada's Palomar, if you like. Um, and that this was going to, this is going to be perhaps the biggest, most efficient, uh, <laughs> next generation spectrographic instrument. It's just quite amazing. I thought I got that wrong. It's perfect. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation to talk here. So, when I was uh, putting this talk together, I changed the title slightly. I was conscious of the fact I'd seen the schedule at that point, so I realized I was the last talk. Uh, and so I was thinking, what would you like to hear about for the next three hours? And um, I thought, well, let's uh, talk about MSE. For those of you who know your Canadian facilities, you'll recognize half a, Canadian a current Canadian facility in this picture, uh, because the bottom half uh, is the current building of the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope. The top half, it's been decapitated, and a new head has been put on. And this is the uh, idea behind MSE. But as I was putting this together, I thought, well, to really explain Canada's role uh, in MSE, I need to explain why you want to do MSE. And to do that, uh, I need to explain something about the whole context of where we are uh, in Canadian astronomy and in international astronomy, particularly on sort of the wide field uh, aspects. But then as I, as I was thinking about that, I thought, well, to understand how the heck we got there in the first place to have the sort of facilities on the horizon that we have requires a bit of history. And it turns out that a lot of that history is actually about uh, CFHT. So this next, thanks, this next uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, consider this sort of a, a journey of things that interest me uh, re involving CFHT uh, and Canadian astronomy. Um, in particular, here are a whole bunch of different facilities. This is by no stretch of the imagination a complete list of all of the different things that are going on in international astronomy uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But they focus on two particular things. They focus on very wide field instruments, and by that I mean instruments that cover uh, a degree of the sky, many degrees of the sky, they're designed really for mapping perhaps the entire sky. Um, and really the things which will become the, uh, the jewels in the crown, uh, particularly of Canadian and North American astronomy. Uh, in particular, what you see here uh, are uh, facilities like, uh, like uh, the LSST, which has been mentioned already. This is a massive uh, survey facility, which I'll mention briefly about later. Uh, you already saw, I haven't put JWST here, but I have put WFIRST as another wide field space telescope that will be happening. Euclid uh, as sort of the European equivalent to that, in which actually Canada has a, a fairly significant science uh, role. Also at radio wavelengths, square kilometer array, uh, many of you will probably have heard of that, and even the next generation, a very large array. Um, and Gaia, which is revolutionizing uh, everything we know about stars uh, and stellar populations. Um, those are all the wide field things, or some of the wide field things, uh, but then you also have this. This here is TMT. Uh, and Canada is a massive player in, in TMT. It really will define the future of Canadian uh, optical and near infrared astronomy for the next 50 years. I mean, these sorts of things are amazing. The projects that we have now, I used to joke that SKA is not a project, it's a lifestyle choice. And uh, in terms of the scope of what is ahead of us, uh, and in terms of the science potential, it really is. Uh, but the same is true for really everything uh, that is on this uh, picture. But let's look at something like the TMT, because that's going to be the, the crown jewel uh, in, in the future. Um, how did we get uh, to be doing that in, in, in the first place? Well, this here uh, is an image of the galactic center. I believe this is actually taken uh, from, from the south. And here you see a laser flying up into the galactic center. Um, when you actually zoom in to see uh, what that you're seeing there, this is now an adaptive optics-assisted image of the galactic center. 
And what you see is a huge number uh, of stars uh, with very crisp point sources. This is a very small area, only se uh, a few arc seconds across. Uh, and you can look at this because of uh, adaptive optics, which is a clever way of correcting for the effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, now, uh, when you then look and see the sort of science that can be done just now, in fact, this has been done over the course of uh, the last several years, uh, of actually what you can then do when you can really hone in right in the very center, uh, you can see all of these stars, uh, which each have names, of course. There's only a small number of them right at the very center. And you see they're all orbiting something. Okay. That is the most direct evidence, I think, that exists for a, super, a supermassive black hole at the center of galaxies, i.e. our galaxy. Uh, because these are all orbiting something, and they're all doing so very, very fast. Okay. Now, you could, I'm, I'm, this isn't necessarily the science area that I work on, but that's extraordinary, right, that you can see these stars orbit on time scales so a few years in the parts of the sky, which is arc seconds across, uh, if that, uh, assisted using ground-based telescopes by correcting all the effects of the atmosphere. Um, that's really technologically uh, astounding, bluntly. Um, so this is an astounding image. This is even more astounding. This is what TMT will see in a 20-second exposure of that same area. And the center of the galaxy, Sagittarius A star, is right there. This is why uh, we want to be able to build uh, TMT. The one arc second scale actually has just slipped off here. But essentially, one arc second is maybe 1 20th or thereabouts uh, of, of uh, the width of that field there. So this is a really uh, minute area. And that's what TMT will be able to see. OK, so for those of you who don't know what TMT is, TMT is the 13 meter uh, telescope. Uh, and it's a partnership in which Canada has been a, a critical member uh, since really the very start, as I'll come on to. This is a, a simulation of what it will look like. Construction is already underway uh, in the various partner communities. And I expect uh, that you'll be hearing uh, about TMT over the course of presumably this uh, next few months or, or year, uh, as we expect uh, construction to at some point proceed uh, on, in Hawaii. That itself is, is another uh, talk. Um, the scope of this is amazing. Um, and then you realize a couple of things as well. TMT looks the way it does, i.e. that dome, uh, because of Canada, because we're building that dome. Uh, but more particularly, the entire reason for doing something like the TMT, um, TMT is about 10 times the collecting area of a 10 meter telescope, it's three times larger uh, diameter. But the whole reason for doing TMT, and uh, if you're the, in uh, ESO, it's the ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope, and there's also the Giant Magellan Telescope. All these, these are the next three massive telescopes. The reason for doing these is adaptive optics, because that gives you an added advantage. It makes solar light much more concentrated in the center. That boosts your sensitivity by another factor of d squared. So TMT is 100 times more sensitive uh, than a telescope like Keck. The entire, the entire reason for doing it is its AO system. And the entirety of the AO system is being built here in Canada. Right? And that's kind of crazy when you think about it, because, wow, this is you know, a, a, a telescope that looks the way it does and acts the way it does. And Canada, the people who are calling the shots in terms of uh, designing the critical components. How did we get there? You know, the, the, the world is full of very, very uh, many bright people. Uh, and yet, in this specific area, Canada really does uh, rule the world. Or, yeah, really rules the world. Uh, so why? Well, this is where TMT will go. Uh, this is just a, a movie uh, going up uh, Mauna Kea, uh, where many of Canada's current ground-based optical telescopes are. That's the shadow of Mauna Kea, uh, which is really quite spectacular when you see it. Uh, and here you see uh, the Canada-France-Hawaii uh, telescope. TMT will be uh, up the top of Mauna Kea uh, alongside CFHT, uh, but alongside also uh, another telescope. CFHT was, uh, had first light in 1979, uh, and at the time it was the largest, uh, most cutting edge uh, ground-based uh, optical facility uh, that there is. This is just a beautiful image uh, that sort of as you pan across the sky, you also then see, uh, because Canada was involved uh, in those early years, as one of the first uh, major uh, communities with a major facility at arguably the single best site for astronomy on the planet. Um, it was also in the uh, later years able to get into Germany. You've just heard 
uh, uh, Don Toc, uh, and he was uh, critical in that. Uh, and so the four meter led to the eight meter. And of course, eight meter leads to then what's the next thing after that? That's, a, that's the 30 meter. Um, but when you look at CFHT specifically, uh, and the things that it did, it had a tremendous number of instruments, uh, and still does have a large number of instruments. Uh, over the seven, from the late 70s through to the early 90s, it was unarguably probably the best in the world in terms of the telescopes. Uh, and there were a large number of images, uh, spectrographs, etc., that the Canadian community was really able to exploit uh, to do fantastic science. Um, after uh, Keck uh, came online, the 10 meter class telescopes, uh, once HST, of course, uh, was up in the sky as well, uh, then CFHC still had a role and really became kind of the best in, in its class. Uh, and what it did, uh, particularly in the later years from about 2003 onwards, was it started specializing its instrumentation. Now it still has a relatively specialized instrumentation suite, but it's now looking at to transform. But in amongst all of that big list of instruments uh, that you have there, uh, there's one in particular, uh, which is called Pueo. Uh, and this was the adaptive optics bonnet. Uh, this was the first ever adaptive optics system uh, deployed on a major uh, astronomical facility. Uh, and of course, Canada had a, a massive role in, in, in building it and using it for science. And in fact, this was a picture of the galactic center taken uh, with Pueo, where you're getting down to the diffraction limit of 3.6 meters for the very first time. Because Canada had that uh, expertise in being able to actually show the world how to do AO in the first place, then when the eight meter comes along, uh, it's then able to say, well, we can leverage that prior knowledge and we can now build Altair. And Altair was uh, the, and still is in fact, uh, the adaptive optics uh, facility that is used with Gemini. And again, you can do great adaptive optics there. And then because you have the eight meter experience now of designing Altair, and a long now heritage uh, of doing adaptive optics technology and a science with adaptive optics, building nefarious is the next natural thing. And nefarious, which is the greatest acronym that's ever been made, nefarious is uh, the near infrared uh, adaptive optics system. I missed out a letter there, but this is the, uh, the adaptive optics system that will work for TMT. And you'll note there a person uh, for scale as to just, you know, that's just the thing that actually other instruments plug into to allow you to reach the diffraction limit with TMT. So you see a heritage here, right? You see the fact that actually um, this 3.6 meter telescope back in 1979 laid the groundworks for the development of a community of an expertise that was leveraged and leveraged again. Uh, and actually was one of the major reasons that we were able to actually have such a, a major role uh, within TMT. And that started really uh, because of CFHT. Now, I don't want to give the impression in any of this talk, because this, this talk is sort of facilities focused, uh, but I hope that by the end of you, the, this talk, you realize that it's not the facilities that drive the science, it's the science that drives the facilities. There was a reason you wanted to build CFHT in the first place. Once you have then built CFHT, you can then use CFHT for a bunch of other things. And the same is true for all uh, different uh, facilities that are being built. There is a science reason behind every single one of them. And it's those science reasons that justify the facility, and it's using that facility that allows a uh, community to grow. Um, so CFHT was fantastic uh, at doing narrow field science, and it still has. It's, uh, and uh, Greg Wade, Wade was talking earlier, he's a big user of, es of espadons, which is a spectral polarimeter on CFHT, still seeing massive use uh, now several years after first light. Uh, an instrument that I used a lot of, uh, and which now sort of focuses more on the wide field aspect, uh, of CFHT is Megacam. Megacam was for many years the largest camera uh, in existence, the largest uh, mosaic camera in the world. Uh, it was subsequently being surpassed now by Hyper Supreme Cam and Subaru, by the Dark Energy camera, uh, and imminently I talk about LSST as well. But this was a massive science array that from which you could just image the sky. And for a long time it had 40 CCDs, but for reasons I won't go into, um, usually only 36 of them were in regular use. Uh, but you could image an entire square degree of the sky at one time. Um, once you can do that, you can do lots of uh, very cool things. When I came to, you may not have picked this up. I'm not actually from Canada originally. Uh, I just have to tell people in case they think I'm from Toronto. Um, so when I came to Canada, uh, one of the things which I was uh, very keen to do uh, was to uh, use Megacam uh, to map uh, the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, we already heard about uh, FAT uh, earlier. 
Um, and this is another survey of, of uh, M31, but not actually focusing on where all the stars are, but just focusing at all the big empty space around uh, M31. And also you'll see there uh, M33, the Triangle of Galaxy as well. Because it turns out when you actually map that big empty space, it's not big and empty, uh, it's full of stars. Uh, and those stars actually trace out this low surface brightness uh, structure that you can't actually see directly through the integrated light, but which in fact extends out, I mean the distance between uh, uh, Triangle and Andromeda is about uh, 15 uh, degrees on the sky. Um, so this is now expanding out over that entire area. You see the little blue uh, dots, the big blue dots I should say, are dwarf galaxies. All of the, what's plotted here is just the density of stars, giant stars that are consistent with being an M31. And you can see a massive amount of structure, and that structure actually, actually tells you about the formation history uh, of M31. You also notice the size of the full moon in comparison. This is where wide field cameras uh, are absolutely essential. Pandas is just one of the large programs. Perhaps the most, uh, the most famous of them all was the first one. This one was done uh, more recently. And the first one was the CFHT uh, Legacy Survey. And this really was um, the first of a new generation of wide field surveys, uh, which again spanned uh, tens, hundreds, uh, if not thousands of square degrees of the sky. Uh, and the idea was to actually like, look at these large volumes of space to both look at the nearby galaxy, the stellar populations that you see, uh, but also the distant universe. And the CFHE Legacy Survey, by far the most impactful uh, part of that survey was the Supernova Legacy Survey, uh, which pre basically provided the most uh, precise constraints uh, on some of the cosmological parameters here, the density of matter in the universe, the density of dark energy in the universe, the uh, W and other cosmological coefficients, particularly when you combine those with other ways of measuring uh, the, the fundamental parameters of our cosmological model, uh, provided some of those most precise constraints available uh, on these fundamental constituents uh, of the universe. So again, that was the first of its kind. It's been, since been uh, surpassed in terms of wide field surveys. Dark energy camera has been doing surveys uh, and others, and in fact, this one, I, I laugh actually because there was quite a few, yeah, you showed a lot of my movies, man. Uh, so this was, um, this is, you've already seen already, this was a simulation of LSST. But the amazing thing about LSST is that we're talking about uh, an image of the sky every 15 seconds and about a thousand images of the sky every night um, uh, and mapping the sky, what, every three nights or something like that. Uh, the volume of data there is, is absolutely immense. This is just, uh, showing you sort of a possible way that LSST might map the sky. Just if you can see the little counter there, you'll notice the day hasn't progressed beyond a single, uh, a single integer yet. Uh, so this is all during one night. Look at all the different pointings it's doing. Uh, and again, this isn't a simulation anymore. This was the end of last month, the picture that I could, the most recent picture I could get. It's going to be active very, very soon. Okay, so that's good. So. We now have CFHT, so to bring it back to CFHT, we have CFHT. Uh, it's our first light in 1979. I don't want to tell you what age I am, but it's older than I am. Um, it's been tremendous. It's uh, helped position Canada for a large, uh, large number of different types of science, narrow field science, adaptive optics, uh, wide field science with these wide field surveys. Uh, so what happens now? Uh, and I like to pose this uh, question somewhat controversially. Uh, which is to say, should it have a future? And if so, why? Which is to say, I love the fact that it's been brilliant. So what's it going to do tomorrow? That's, I hope, the question that uh, all of us should be asking about any major astronomical facility that's funded by your money, right? These are all taxpayer-funded facilities that we use here, at least in Canada. Obviously, if you have a philanthropic uh, donor who wants to do whatever, that's great. This is a lot of public money we are playing with generally. So why should it have a future? It's been great in the past, but just because it's been great in the past doesn't mean to say it should exist tomorrow. But it also might give you a clue that there's actually maybe some elements there that are worth keeping, that are worth thinking about, and that are worth using. Uh, I would say that uh, in terms of the future, the future has to be defined by science. What's the science? What's going on in the world? Uh, what's the science that we're interested in doing? This is a whole bunch of different facilities that represent, I haven't even put JWST here, JWST would uh, just, I mean, the, the, the amount of money that is being spent here is incredible. The amount of science that is being done here, though, 
is incredible as well. Um, just to focus in on a few things, LSST uh, and also Subaru Hyper Supreme Cam. Those are the two sort of major images, one in the south that will be working soon, one in the north that's already working. Different model from LSST, it doesn't have the same data rate, but still a very impressive deep imager of the sky. Gaia, I will come back to, uh, because I think Gaia is absolutely phenomenal in what it is doing. Euclid W first in terms of the cosmology. Uh, at X-ray wavelengths and the other wavelengths, you have things like Erosita. Uh, Plato, we heard about Bright earlier, that Plato is, is, uh, is uh, a facility that's going to be looking for stars, uh, planets around other stars in a very industrial sense. Uh, SKA, I haven't even shown NGBLA here. NGBLA is something that would actually span the frequency range missed by SKA and ALMA, but in between. And then in the bottom corner there, you have uh, lots of submillimeter facilities. ALMA, though it's very dark. CCAT, which is potentially a sort of wide field version of ALMA. Uh, and you have a tremendous number of facilities there. Um, and they're all designed to do something, because they're all designed to do, have certain science cases open up new parameter spaces. And you look at that and you ask, well, what sort of parameter space is still missing? And the one that uh, you come to the conclusion of is optical and near-infrared spectroscopy. Because you have something like the LSST and Gaia and W first and Euclid, they have small spectroscopic components. Um, the longer wavelengths you have, uh, it's a different way of collecting the data, of course. You have spectroscopic information there already if you have frequency information. But at optical and near-infrared, uh, where are you actually getting your spectra? Um, and spectra is fairly fundamental, as it will come on to in a second. Uh, and particularly if you have the billions of objects that you're going to find in any one of these surveys, literally we'll be finding billions upon billions upon billions of targets, because uh, they all span large areas of the sky, for the things that don't span the large areas of the sky, but which can provide you with absolutely exquisite measurements of whatever you choose to point them at, the TMT, the ELT, uh, the GMT, how do you decide which of those billions of targets are the ones that are worth following up? Again, more information than just the colors, just the photometry, just how bright the objects are, would be desirable. And so that is where uh, we came up with the idea uh, for MSE. And it's been uh, under development, at least under the guise of MSE, uh, since 20, uh, for 2014. And at the current rate, we hope that it will see uh, first light uh, at the end of uh, 2020s. Um, so just to give you uh, the speaker earlier by JWST, uh, was, you know, spectra are kind of a harder thing to communicate uh, compared to a nice image. Uh, so here's just my uh, toy of what we're looking at. This is the Hubble Deep Field. You take a, ga a galaxy, you look at its spectrum, just breaking it up literally uh, you know, through a prism or using other techniques, and you can then look at the intensity of light as a function of wavelength. When you do that for, say, a galaxy, you see emission lines uh, potentially telling you about star formation that's going on in the galaxy. You see absorption telling you about things to do with the chemical composition of the galaxy. Um, in terms of where those positions or the size of the widths of those lines are, tell you about how much of that element is there, tell you about the velocity of the object, tell you about its redshift, how fast it's moving away or towards us. It's a tremendous amount of information. The whole idea uh, with MSE is to do multi-object spectroscopy, for which I should also say CFHT had the first of them. The first multi-object spectrograph was MOSSIS on a major astronomical facility, and that was on CFHT. The idea of multi-object spectroscopy is not new. Doing it on this scale uh, is actually not new really either, except nobody's ever done it before. Um, so the idea is we take CFHT and we replace it, and we replace it with a 10-meter class telescope. And we need to go to 10 meters because we need to look at very, very faint things. People are already doing this sort of science with 4-meter uh, telescopes. With 2-meter, that's what SDSS is. Um, you need to design the telescope so you can see very, very wide fields. Uh, one and a half square degrees by about one and a half square degrees, roughly that kind of size. Uh, and then you equip it with just a massive suite of spectrographs, such that the only thing you ever do with this is take spectra. In particular, you take about 4,000, 4,500 spectra every time you point it at the sky for about 4,000 objects in that one and a half degree field of view, uh, such that instead of just one spectrum, you actually have a, a tremendous number. I can't remember how long this goes on. Eventually, I just sort of got fed up with playing with Keynote and PowerPoint. Uh, but you can see the idea is that every single pointing, uh, you get about 4,000 spectra. If you took one hour for every pointing of MSE, which likely is too long, then there would be more than 10 million objects that you, for which you would obtain the full spectrum for 
every year and that's taking into account observing inefficiencies taking into account uh, weather and such like uh, some of you might know Dennis Crabtree Dennis Crabtree uh, was uh, has just uh, stopped being the director of the DAO recently uh, and he he's quite a witty person uh, at times uh, and he said this if a picture is worth a thousand words a spectrum is worth a thousand pictures um, and in terms of the information content uh, yes, in terms of the information content that astronomers can build from those spectra, in terms of the chemical composition, in terms of the dynamics of those objects, it can provide you with incredible information that you cannot get from imaging alone. Um, what's the sort of science uh, you could do with this? Well, um, I'm just going to focus on a couple of things uh, that I find interesting. Uh, Gaia is a space mission uh, of uh, ESA that is currently uh, taking data is currently reporting back the positions uh, very, very precisely of all of the stars it can see in the, in the night sky down to about 20th magnitude. Um, its precision in terms of how well it can measure a position uh, goes for the brightest star to one micro arc second. And you go, whoa, one micro arc second, what's that? Like, what's one arc minute? Maybe you can get what one arc minute is. Uh, one arc second, well, that's pretty small. One micro arc second. So to put this in context, I've been talking for about half an hour, and the back of the room is maybe, I don't know, uh, 20 meters away. I'm rubbish with distance estimates. Gaia sees the distance my hair grows in a period of one hour when viewed from a distance of 100 meters. Right? That's a micro arc second. Okay? That's what we can do. And I, say, I keep saying Gaia does this. Right? The most amazing thing about astronomy is that you know, these facilities are being designed by people. We figured out how to measure positions to one micro arc second. Okay, that's absolutely incredible. And that's what Gaia is doing. So this has been a, a movie that's just been running of the night sky changing. As all of the bright stars that you would see in the sky uh, just move on the, motion, on the orbits that, they've, have, that have been calculated for them because guys actually seen these stars move uh, relative, to, relative to each other to precisions of micro arc seconds. So that tells you how stars are moving one way, but it doesn't tell you how stars are moving uh, in another way. And in fact, how stars move is going to be dependent upon what the mass distribution of the galaxy is. And the mass distribution of the galaxy is at some points dominated by stars in the very central regions, but for the most part is dominated by dark matter. This is what we think actually happens during galaxy formation. If you could have dark matter goggles and just see all the things where the, which, uh, where the mass matters, uh, then this is the formation process of a Milky Way-like galaxy, we think. Right? This is the sort of model that seems to work best uh, and match the most observables that we've so far been able to do. It might be wrong. I, you know, the whole point of doing observational astronomy, frankly, is to prove theorists wrong, um, because that's the only thing you can do as a scientist. Um, and so we want to prove this wrong, because we want to improve our understanding of how these things actually work. Well, that dark matter mess has dynamical signatures. Okay? The stars that we can see are moving the way they are moving because of the mass distribution of the galaxy. So therefore, the stars are telling us about what the current distribution of dark matter in the galaxy is. If only we could actually get millions upon millions upon millions of such velocities. If only we could do so across the entirety of the galaxy out to very, very large radius from the galaxy where you have the strongest linchpins. If only you could have a facility that you could do that, well, then you could really start nailing this problem very, very well. And it's not just. Um, the kinematics. On the left, there is a sort of light distribution. If you could see, well, actually, this is actually, that's the stellar distribution uh, is on your left. Uh, but in the middle and on the right, you have two plots of what actually we think the metallicity of the galaxy should be. Where are the heavy elements? How much heavy elements are there as a function of position? Also, the alpha elements, those types of stars formed via the alpha process. Um, these things, these distributions are predictions of models. They're obviously statistical in nature and such like. But again, if only you could have a way of measuring the chemistry of the galaxy at every position, uh, then you could actually start really being, uh, giving very precise uh, insights into the formation process. And in fact, uh, in many respects, MSC will be the ultimate uh, facility for understanding uh, chemical evolution in the universe, indeed the entire origin of the periodic table. Um, the gravitational wave detections uh, of the last uh, couple of years have been absolutely fantastic. And it drew attention to many people uh, that we didn't actually know where all of the elements in the periodic table are made. Right? The site of the R process 
uh, looks as if it's probably colliding neutron stars. But we don't, we didn't actually know this, and we still have a way, long way to go before we can actually be confident about why we have the chemical composition of the universe we do, and where all those elements actually came from in the first place. Uh, if you look at the high resolution mode of MSE, MSE, when you take a spectrum, you can look at it in very fine detail or in coarse detail. Uh, so in order to do a lot of the detailed co uh, chemical composition studies of the Milky Way, you want to be looking at very, very high resolution. There, you can only sort of see little bands of the stellar spectrum. What I've shown there is a spectrum of a metal poor red giant branch star, for what it's worth. And you can see sort of the little windows uh, where we would actually be able to get very high precision spectral measurements. You then see zoom-ins of those windows. I would just draw your attention to the UV window, the blue window. The blue window there is shown uh, along the bottom, and there's a massive density of lines. You then zoom in on just a tiny little bit of that tiny little window, and then you see all of the different absorptions due to all of the different chemical elements. Uh, many of those chemical elements are formed via different nucleosynthetic pathways. Not all elements are equal. Different elements form in different uh, mechanisms and different astrophysical sites. By probing all of those, including by identifying elements like europium, uh, which is an R process element, we can actually provide the most detailed understanding possible uh, of the chemical composition of stars in our galaxy, doing that for millions upon stars to actually really understand why do we have the chemical composition of the universe that we have, particularly in our own galaxy. Um, this, again, so you talked this morning, right? Um, it was like, okay, he showed me one movie. Oh, he's also showing this movie. Um, so this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This was um, kind of like an LSST, except not, because uh, LS uh, SCSS does both imaging and spectroscopy. It is basically a two-meter MSE. MSE is a 12-meter, 11-meter version uh, of the SCSS. Uh, and this is the spectroscopic catalog uh, that was produced for SCSS in terms of all of the galaxies for which SCSS was able to measure uh, redshifts positions, because of the loopback time, they're called redshifts. Uh, measure the positions of all the galaxies, a million of them, uh, with information in all of those galaxies. Look at the richness of that data set. That's an incredible data set, and it's rightly still producing amazing science. So, SDSS, if that big circle is the observable universe, the SDSS spectroscopic catalog of about a million galaxies uh, is within that little black circle. Uh, MSE, is designed to basically go out uh, to nearly, not quite at sort of times when JWST is looking back to, um, but out to you know only a few giga years after uh, the Big Bang, doing essentially an SDSS way out to these very high redshifts, where remember again, you get 10 million spectra per year, not one million spectra over the total of the survey. So again, the sort of science that you're doing, uh, the data is, is unprecedented. This is a, map, essentially here we have look back time along the bottom. Okay, so about 13 giga years is the Big Bang. But what you're seeing there is this, a star formation rate. But essentially, what that's telling you is when a star is forming, when are most stars forming uh, in the universe. Uh, and SDSS probed very local, essentially local times. So what's the universe doing roughly now? And that's what the main SDSS survey was all about. Uh, MSC is essentially doing SCSS as a function of redshift, including out to and including the peak of that. When are the most stars forming? Because that's when the most stars are forming, it's when the most galaxies are forming, it's when the most supermassive black holes are forming. Uh, the person who's in charge of, or one of the co-leads of the science working group of the science team in this area, says it's basically doing SCSS, but at a time when the universe was actually interesting. Um, which I would never say publicly, because clearly that's, that's not fair. But again, in terms of uh, the new ability to not do what's already been done, we don't want to have a small telescope looking at local things, but to push into new parameter space to really extend on the heritage that we already have from doing things like SDSS, but just never having done this on the scale of the facility that is required. Um, so if you forgive me a little bit of indulgence here, um, I don't know the backstories to almost all astronomical facilities that are out there. I pick up stuff here and there. I do know all of the backstory to MSE. Um, and so therefore, I think it's interesting uh, just to kind of emphasize again that, you know, these facilities don't pop into existence, right? They are, people have ideas and, and work at them. 
Um, and here, Canada has a tremendous role. In 2010, um, Canada was doing what was called the Long Range Plan 2010. And in fact, we do them every 10 years. So there's a new one, and it's called the Long Range Plan 2020. Um, anyway, the Long Range Plan 2010 um, had a call for white papers where astronomers put in ideas for what they think should be happening in the future, give their opinions on the science, give their opinion on the facilities. Um, and as we were doing that exercise, a, a group of us in particular, I, I still remember the conversation that myself and another person, Pat Cote, um, had. And it was like, well, what, what would be really great to do? And he goes, well, we're looking at ST, uh, LSST. That's a fantastic thing. But LSST is imaging. There's a huge amount of time domain as well. But in terms of you know, SDSS versus LSST, LSST is the imaging bit of uh, SDSS. Wouldn't it be great to do the spectroscopic bit? Uh, but where could you do it? And then uh, Pat said, why? Well, I think actually um, you know, we could do it at CFHT. And I was like, no, that's too small a telescope. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. And I'll get back to what happened next after that. Um, but suffice to say, it turned out actually CFHT could be a site where you could do a spectroscopic LSST. Um, so for the next couple of years, uh, Pat Coutet, in fact, in fact, let me just show some pictures here. Pat Coutet led a scientific technical feasibility study uh, where essentially we just were trying to show the CFHT board at the time that this was not a completely nutty idea, that there was actually some precedence for our nuttiness. Uh, and eventually in 2014, uh, the board agreed that this was not entirely nutty and it was worthwhile uh, looking at. And so I just want to highlight a couple of people here because uh, Pat, uh, for the early years, getting a project like that off the ground is, is very uh, challenging. Uh, Dave Crampton is there as well. Um, I didn't really know Dave prior to uh, the start of uh, what was then NGCFHT. Um, but again, in terms of sort of conversations that, that matter, um, Pat and I had that conversation I just told you about. Then two days later, I was at Pat's house. I think a postdoc was leaving or something like that. And uh, so there was a little bit of a party. And uh, David Cramden said, hey, so Pat told me what you guys were talking about. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, it sounds a great idea. What do we do now? Oh, OK. <laughs> what, what do we do now? Uh, and it was literally probably that. that then sort of we went through and spoke to Pat. And, and the rest is, is what happened next. And what happened next was we were able to get some absolutely excellent people involved. Uh, people uh, like Rick Marinsky there in the black t-shirt and also Derek Salmond already at CFHT. Uh, in terms of the history of CFHT, in terms of people astronomy owes an awful lot to, Derek Salmond is certainly up there. And um, so we were the sort of initial core project office team trying to get this project off the ground. And Doug Simons had just come in as CFHT director uh, and in fact was very partial to the idea. And D Doug, as the, as the executive director, really, if he hadn't sort of you know, embraced us, um, then I'm not sure what would have happened. Um, and then Key Zito, uh, Rick was sort of you know, a, a temporary uh, person who got us you know, to where we needed to be. And then Key, as, as a project manager, uh, project engineer, heavily involved in the Nefarious, actually, in many of the early days. And he's really given the whole project a level of uh, professionalism that's, that can't be uh, over-exaggerated. And then most recently as well, Jennifer Marshall, uh, has uh, stepped up as a new project scientist for MSE just in the last year. And again, she's really helping to take the science team uh, to new places to get the scientists excited. Um, so the reason this isn't nutty is, is as follows. This is CFHT. It was built in the 70s. Um, that means it's an old design. That means it's got lots and lots of steel. Um, and you can see that there's an awful lot of space uh, in that dome, such that um, it's possible to actually put MSE on the same pier, on the same big block of concrete, uh, with only minimal reinforcements. And while you obviously have to replace the dome because the slit wouldn't be big enough, uh, you can actually keep the dome more or less the same size, uh, just a minor increase uh, in the size, or a relatively minor increase in the size. In terms of the external appearance, they're not dramatically uh, different. Now, the reason we knew that was possible, I didn't know that was possible. The reason Pat knew that was possible, and the reason Dave Crampton knew that was possible, um, was that this had already been looked at. It had been looked at in the, uh, in the 90s. And it had been looked at because after Canada had built uh, CFHT, they thought, wouldn't it be nice to build a really big telescope? Um, and so there was the VLOT, the Very Large Optical Telescope, uh, which was a good name. 
Um, and it was concluded that actually within this current CFHT dome, you could put a 12 to 16 meter uh, telescope. Um, and so that was the origins of the Canadian VLOT project. VLOT subsequently joined forces with KELT and became TMT. Um, bringing it full circle. Um, and a fun fact, Keck, 3.6 meters, weighs 266 tons. The 10 meter Keck telescopes are only four tons heavier. Uh, and it's because of that sort of fluke of engineering of the designs of the time that we can actually uh, use uh, CFHT and so much of the current infrastructure of CFHT. Um, so then what has to happen is you have to take all of the science cases. I only focused on two stars and galaxies, but, yet the, but uh, I, there's uh, quite a, a large number of science cases uh, uh, for a facility like this. You map those science cases into requirements, uh, and then that sort of starts giving you what the actual telescope has to look like. Uh, and the conclusion was it has to be a prime focus telescope. It has to have uh, an 11 meter aperture. Uh, it's a segmented mirror telescope to get it that large that we're leveraging an awful lot of TMT design. Uh, TMT and ELT can only have such big mirrors because they're doing segments. We want to copy as much of that as possible, but we are only using 60 segments as opposed to many hundreds of segments. It's a wide field telescope with a one and a half degree field of view. At the prime focus, you have positioners which lead to two different suites of spectrographs, a low resolution spectrograph, the sort of spectrograph you'd use uh, for extra galactic astronomy, for faint sources, for doing your cosmological surveys, for doing your extra galactic surveys as to how galaxies form at cosmic noon, uh, and a high resolution uh, suite of spectrographs which do your really high precision, high uh, spectral resolution studies of stars uh, in the galaxy, brighter sources, you're probably going to use that majority of the, of the time in bright time because you have to be working around the lunar calendar because this is a dedicated facility. Uh, and what we also do is we take a floor out of CFHT to give us a little bit more space um, and then we have to reinforce the pier because building codes have changed, uh, but that's the idea. Uh, we then form uh, an international partnership uh, from 2014-2015. We were able to bring on board, uh, as well as Canada, also China, France, India, uh, Hawaii, and Australia. Um, they did, uh, they've been designing all of the different subsystems. In particular, uh, Canada, uh, we have DSL, Dynamic Structures Limited, who are doing the TMT dome. We also would very much like them to do the MSC dome. We're also doing the fiber feed system. That is to say, how do you transport the light from all the way at the top of the telescope down to where your spectrographs are. Um, France is looking at the low resolution spectrograph, remember that extra galactic spectrograph. Uh, China is looking at the high resolution spectrograph. India is looking at segmented mirrors and how to actually build uh, that M1 mirror leveraging off their TMT experience. Uh, and Australia's uh, masters of the fiber positioning systems. Uh, and the result of that whole uh, conceptual design study um, is, is this. This is the full system design to conceptual design level uh, of MSC, where you can see the 11.25 meter telescope. You can see way up the prime focus unit, which is very crammed, packed, full of lots of uh, subunits. You see some of the spectrographs sitting on what look like Naismith platforms, but we don't have a Naismith focus, so they're just instrument platforms. Uh, and the high resolution spectrographs you can't see because they're down in the CUDE room underneath the telescope. Um, the cost is a bargain to only $424 million, um, which I think you'll agree. How cheap is that? Uh, so $424 million. So this is exactly the one in the ballpark in which you would expect a sort of 11 meter type telescope. Uh, in order to get to that, we've actually spent approximately $10 million. Most of that has been in kind contributions from the partnership, who are all obviously excited and motivated to be doing this work in the first place. Uh, the next phase that we're moving into right now is preliminary design. That's about $25 million, uh, but the total cost is about $425 million. There's a large risk cost here, that is to say contingency, essentially, uh, because we're estimating all of these costs from conceptual design. So as the design progresses, gets more detailed, you retire a lot of risks, you have more confidence in your estimate, obviously. That shows you a breakdown but of the cost, but it's not really too important uh, for this talk. Point being, right now, in the international scene, everybody appreciates that this capability is the one thing that's clearly missing from this basically this international network of next generation facilities, which I've shown you several pictures of, which include ALMA, which include SKA, which includes TMT, which includes LSST, which includes space-based wide field imagers and such like. Where do we get the very faint object spectroscopy at the optical infrared? 
Uh, ESO have conducted studies and they agree uh, that this capability needs to be made, though they are currently not doing it. Uh, in the US, uh, they're particularly keen to leverage their LSST experience. And again, there's a strong community there who recognize that this type of capability is the thing that we need. Uh, again, the US and others have this at the four meter class levels, but they don't have it at the 10 meter class levels to really push out to the highest redshift, to really push out to the distant parts of the galaxy. So we in Canada and the rest of the MSC collaboration are in a fairly good scene, a uh, fairly good place. Uh, in the past year, the science team has grown from 100 scientists to more than well, 385 scientists in 31 countries, um, which is rather uh, astounding. Uh, in terms of what needs to happen next, uh, well, we have Canadian Long Range Plan 2020. Um, we also have France, the French Prospectif uh, 2019. We also have the Australian Midterm Review of their Decadal Review 2019, which is not as catchy. Um, we also have Astro 2020 in the States. Uh, so it turns out that the timing of MSE for so long has historically sucked. Uh, and so far as we came up with this idea after all of those previous plans, but now we're coming up to all of those plans again. Uh, and we have, I think, a very solid case uh, to make. Ultimately, I think we need to recruit one or two uh, more international partners. Uh, currently, the US are observers. Uh, I very much hope that after Astro 2020, they decide to become full members. Uh, and within the next week, we, uh, we are in talks with another uh, collaboration from another country, an anagram of KU. Um, and we expect to hopefully be able to make an announcement next week about some more people joining, joining the partnership. And the CFHT board are now fully on board as well. And at the start of this year, uh, put out a statement uh, affirming the intention uh, to make CFHT into uh, MSE. The schedule is such that um, we have a lot more design work to do, which will keep us busy through to about 2022. That's the end of preliminary design. And everything after that we call construction. Um, where basically you're looking at about five years of deconstruction of CFHT and construction of MSE, uh, such that we'd be starting to do the science commissioning, the first science testing uh, at the end of next decade. And again, we want to have that because we want to link in with LSST, we want to link in with others. So this last uh, 50 minutes now, sorry for taking a bit longer, uh, I've tried to sort of give you my perspective, obviously mostly on uh, MSE, but in terms of you can't think about uh, any facility in isolation. They don't work like that. Science doesn't work like that. And if people talk about facilities just because here, here's a facility, no. Ask them what the science is. Uh, no telescope has an ex existential right to exist. CFHT, though, has been tremendous for us in the past. And it offers us, I believe, a tremendous opportunity for the future. Uh, it has really uh, paved the way uh, for quite a, a few different elements of what you see in the spot. Uh, and uh, it can rise as well uh, to be a critical part of that whole network in the future uh, and the science that it will enable. Uh, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. I, th I think the uh, Canada has every reason to be very proud of the current CFHT and even more so of what's coming. My favorite part of it is the way you've designed the dome so that because you're never going to have a wind problem with the dome like that. But could you tell us a little bit more how the dome is going to move around to follow, to follow where the telescope is going? Yeah, so, um, so we are leveraging actually on very extensive studies that have been done uh, on the dome structures. Uh, I thought I had an extra slide, I don't. Um, our dome looks a lot like the TMT dome, you notice, and that's not by accident uh, because TMT have done a very detailed study of all the different domes. Now, there's, it's, it turns out that the site in Mauna Kea is a phenomenal site for optical astronomy, as, as I'm sure everybody is aware. The free atmosphere seeing is 0.4 arc seconds. Uh, it's actually critical for MSE, even though we're a spectrograph. Many people think, oh, it's spectroscopy, image quality doesn't matter. That's wrong when you're at the scale of a 12-meter telescope with 4,000 spectra trying to fit them into a spectrograph that is a, phys a meaningful physical size that you can build. Uh, so we actually need to have very small images. Uh, the control environment, the thermal environment offered by that dome 
uh, is actually spectacularly good. In particular, though, as well, because we are sort of doing a retrofit, the whole mass weight constraints uh, of the Colotte Dome uh, are far superior to any of the other domes that exist. Most of the other facilities on Mauna Kea and elsewhere, they have multiple different types of domes. And many of them all actually produce more or less the same kind of seeing. So you could sort of argue that saying, well, it doesn't really matter too much which one you have and which not. However, there were some people who argue very strongly that's not the case. And certainly to get to the very best image quality, the studies that TMG did really showed that Collot can allow you to do that. Uh, and again, just the whole mass constraints that we have, it's the ideal thing to retrofit. Hi there. Thanks for your talk, Alan. Um, have you thought about the impact on the annual CFHT calendar? <laughs> actually, yes, Jean Charles Coulondre will, uh, will never forgive me. I no. actually have a real question. Okay. <laughs> um, what about permitting? Uh, any thoughts on that? And uh, would the staff levels be different? Um, and I, I, I wish I knew this. Is it adaptive optics used in spectroscopy? And if yep. so, the, uh, is the existing sure. AI going to be, or AO going to be? A, totally. Yeah. Okay, so I'll do those in reverse uh, order. So in terms of the AO, AO can be used for spectroscopy, and indeed much of the spectroscopy for TMT will require AO. Essentially, spectroscopy, the size of your spectrograph scales is the size of your input input pupil, which is basically the size of your mirror. So as you get bigger and bigger mirrors, you need bigger and bigger spectrographs unless you do other tricks. Uh, so adaptive optics is really essential for TMT to be able to build physically possible spectrographs. For us, actually, um, it's not required. One of the major challenges for AO is doing it over very wide fields. The TMT field of view is going to be about 30 by 30 arc seconds, and that's considered a wide field for the adaptive optics that it has. So to do adaptive optics over a degree by a degree can in principle be done with a thing called ground layer adaptive optics, uh, but it's still highly experimental and we basically traded that the gain was not sufficient. So again, we're really relying on the pristine image quality delivered by the site itself. So we want to control all other things like the dome seeing uh, to an absolute minimum. So MSE will not use adaptive optics. In terms of permitting, yes, absolutely. So um, the key thing right now that is going on um, is that Mauna Kea, there is a thing called the master lease. And the master lease, so basically the space where the telescopes are is rented. I think it's a 65 year lease and it's going to terminate in uh, 2033. Which means every single telescope currently on Mauna Kea has to be off Mauna Kea by 2033, unless there is a lease renewal. The lease renewal is happening now in terms of its illegal process uh, led by the University of Hawaii. Uh, and that started about a year or so ago and is expected to go on for at least another year or year and a half or thereabouts prior to what we hope will be a new master lease being issued. MSC will not proceed with any of its permitting or construction until after uh, that master lease has been renewed because clearly uh, it could not be renewed because that's the whole point of doing the renewal process and our timeline just wouldn't make sense to build it and then decommission it a week later. Uh, so that's actually sort of built into this, and so the timeline actually works quite nicely. But after um, the, the mass lease permitting, yes, there is then the MSE par uh, permitting. However, MSE is actually being considered as part of the master lease anyway, because they know what's going on. So we are actually being considered just now by the state as part of this Uber master lease issue as well. So the permitting is absolutely critical, of course, uh, and that's proceeding just now. But the key step being the master lease. <laughs> yes, we could have the first spectroscopic calendar, um, which I think we can do. The, we should we should join force and figure out how to do it best. <coughs> Thank you very much. That's really, uh, I thought you were not a spectator.